So I um, <clears throat> wanted to talk today about um, a little bit about where we are, uh, especially relative to some of the recent comments by the, the president and other folks uh, out of the administration uh, and a couple of recent studies that give us, uh, I think, a, a little more insight into what uh, we might expect over the next coming months. Um, so our, our theme for today is it's not over yet, uh, despite what you may hear uh, in the, the, the media. So many of you may have seen stories or, or actually seen the 60 Minutes interview, uh, which was aired on Sunday, <clears throat> where the president uh, essentially declared that the pandemic is over, uh, that while we'll still be dealing with COVID, that um, I guess the the pandemic part of COVID-19 is uh, is over. And this has, I, I think, been appropriately criticized among a number of circles of uh, folks with epidemiology expertise. But uh, it seems that the administration has decided uh, to put a stake in the ground. Uh, now, currently where we are, as you can see, we're uh, at relatively plateaued levels of cases, uh, hospitalizations, and deaths, which are certainly above previous troughs we've seen uh, in uh, less active seasons, such as the summer. And as we all know, we're, we're on the cusp of uh, what is uh, what has been for the last um, <clears throat> two years, uh, the, the more active COVID transmission season, which corresponds with uh, respiratory viral disease season in general. And you can see, again, we're still averaging uh, above 450 deaths uh, per day. And that's been, again, relatively consistent for a couple of months now. So between 450 and 500 uh, is obviously uh, a lot more deaths than we see with seasonal influenza or any other uh, respiratory virus uh, or uh, really any other individual infectious disease over the course of a year. So um, I think that the the numbers would tell you that uh, the, the pandemic is not yet over, given the number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths we're seeing on a daily basis. And again, the prospects for uh, what's likely to happen in the next couple of months. And, and I think, again, some studies uh, we'll talk about show us that. Now, I, I think it's uh, <clears throat> helpful to put into context that this isn't necessarily the first time uh, this president has made statements that many epidemiologists or pandemic experts disagree with. If you remember July 4th of 2021, the president uh, essentially declared that we had uh, won our independence from COVID and, and that uh, uh, we were no longer going to let it control our lives um, uh, interesting comments, given the fact that we've had uh, essentially 450,000 COVID deaths uh, since that speech was given on July 4th of 2021. Um, <clears throat> more deaths from COVID than had actually occurred uh, prior to his uh, administration taking over on January 20th of 2021. So um, again, not, not the first uh, premature declaration out of this administration, unfortunately, and, and I'm sure it is completely coincidence that there are midterm elections coming up. Um, <clears throat> as we look at some of the recent literature, I think that helps us understand uh, current trends and what we can expect. I thought this was a really good study that was uh, just recently published on preprint MedArchive, um, looking at uh, transmission events and uh, vaccine effectiveness in California prisons. So <clears throat> uh, if you remember uh, a number of the discussions we've had about vaccine uh, effectiveness, we've caveated with questions about the design and, and some of the uh, inherent bias that occurs in, in most of the studies and, and just the reality of, of real world um, constraints on design where a, a significant amount of bias is introduced into those studies looking at vaccine effectiveness. So if you remember the test negative uh, retrospective design that's generally used to look at vaccine effectiveness, um, inherently biases uh, where disease incidence and in unvaccinated is generally underestimated. Uh, and if you think about it, it makes sense. And again, we've talked about this before, but uh, if you are not 
vaccinated uh, against COVID-19 at this point, um, you probably, A, either don't have significant medical conditions and are less likely to be concerned when you develop symptoms, and or uh, you, you have other ideological biases against uh, COVID and, and vaccines, and you're much less likely to go and seek a test. And so the reality is uh, many of the people who are ill with COVID, particularly mild disease, uh, certainly don't go seek tests uh, for COVID if they are unvaccinated. Uh, I think this is attested to by the fact that um, in Nebraska, it still appears that about one in five Nebraskans have never had a documented COVID-19 test. So you can see, and, and that's obviously heavily skewed towards some of our rural counties and populations. So <clears throat> we're not doing a great job of ascertaining cases in those populations, and thus it really skews how we uh, can measure vaccine effectiveness. Now, the beauty of this study is it was done on a population where they had uh, much more universal surveillance testing uh, and ability to do uh, routine and repeated tests uh, because this was done across 37 uh, or 35, sorry, California state prisons. And this looked uh, at data from the BA1 wave uh, and BA2 waves, um, looking at uh, index cases uh, in those prisons and then incidents of disease in uh, close contact. So essentially uh, prisoners who shared uh, a cell with uh, those index cases. And you can see that during this study period, uh, first of all, it's a very large study where uh, over 155,000 people were followed to, to get these data. Uh, and on average, these people were tested over eight times uh, over the course of that uh, time period. So you can see very frequent testing uh, and essentially uh, universal testing among most of these people. So under ascertainment is going to be much less of a problem. So in this study, as you can see, they ended up with uh, over 1,200 index cases uh, that they then matched based on vaccination status. Um, most of those cases were vaccinated, but uh, over 270 uh, were unvaccinated. And then they looked at uh, incidents among close contacts. Um, so there's 1,200 cases vac uh, total, 276 unvaccinated, uh, and uh, 985 vaccinated. So uh, as you can see, uh, looking at the incidents in close contacts uh, within five days of the index case testing positive. Um, marine duration of exposure was around uh, a little over two days, almost two and a half days. Um, you know, that's the amount of time the person spent with the index case. You can see that uh, this population is obviously heavily skewed uh, towards males. Uh, it is quite a bit younger uh, than the average U.S. population and certainly younger than uh, the higher risk age groups that we worry about most. Uh, and race is uh, skewed towards uh, minorities. And, and this obviously all reflects demographics of prison populations. And so uh, take with a grain of salt when you're trying to apply to the general population. However, um, you know, I think it does provide uh, good insight into uh, transmission and vaccine protection. Uh, another thing to point out as well, a uh, pretty uh, large proportion of folks were vaccinated, about 10% were vaccinated uh, with Johnson & Johnson and not boosted necessarily. So uh, vaccine effectiveness there may be a little lower. You can see overall this prison population had relatively high rates of overall vaccination, much higher than the general population of the U.S. So again, over 75% had completed a primary series and boosting rates, especially over the course of the study period where you can see it's the shaded uh, area of the graph uh, were also uh, quite high. Over 50% of the population had been boosted uh, there. So that's, uh, again, well above what the U.S. averages. Uh, now, what they found is that uh, index case transmission events, um, not necessarily contact uh, acquisition of cases, appeared to be linked to vaccination and prior infection status. And this is really important because we haven't had many studies that have allowed us to look at vaccine effect on transmission and transmissibility. So what you can see is if the index case had never been vaccinated, um, <clears throat> that there was almost a 40% uh, attack rate in close contacts. 
Um, <clears throat> this was uh, slightly lower, um, uh, about 30% or so if the person had had a previous infection. So again, immunity from previous infection does seem to impart some uh, reduced transmissibility on the individual. But as you can see, prior vaccination provided a slightly uh, stronger uh, uh, diminishing effect on transmissibility and vaccination plus prior infection even stronger. Now, if you look at the difference between those who'd only received a primary series and booster, you can see that the booster really has a strong impact in terms of reducing transmissibility. So receiving a primary series uh, gave you a relatively similar level of reduced transmission as did prior infection, actually slightly uh, worse. Um, but if you'd received uh, a booster dose, your, uh, your likelihood of transmitting to your cellmate was dramatically reduced. And again, across all of these different categories, you can see that vaccination plus prior infection gave you the best protection. But uh, in boosted individuals, that difference in, with prior infection is relatively small. And so the most uh, important factor here appears to be vaccination and particularly boosting. Here's another way of representing that. So this um, baseline reference uh, rate in secondary attack rate is uh, in people who had not been previously vaccinated or had a history of prior infection. You can see if you had uh, prior infection or prior vaccination, uh, you reduced your risk of transmitting onto your cellmate by a little more than 20%, uh, which is great. If you had both, uh, that risk uh, went down below 40% reduction. So a pretty significant reduction in people who've been vaccinated uh, and uh, had prior infection. But you can see that there's a very strong dose uh, relationship uh, in terms of the number of doses of vaccine you'd received. And so uh, receiving a third dose gave you a significant advantage in terms of uh, providing additional protection and reducing transmission risk. So this really does seem to indicate that vaccine, not only as we've seen in previous studies, protects against hospitalization and, and death, which we've known about, uh, but it also protects against passing infection on to others, which is obviously hugely important in controlling community transmission. And a 40% reduction in transmission is actually a huge reduction if you think about stretching that over the course of multiple generations of disease and, and time. What was also interesting is that they saw a, a very, uh, a, well, certainly a statistically significant correlation uh, in reduction in risk with how long it had been since your last dose of COVID vaccine. So you can see for every five weeks that went by since your last dose of vaccine, uh, your uh, rate of protection went down uh, 6% or so. So um, again, not only the number of doses of vaccine, but the timing from your last dose of vaccine was important in predicting uh, how likely it was that you were going to transmit to somebody else. And, and again, this, this is now, I think, much more um, scientifically rigorous uh, proof of, of some of the things that we've been talking about for, uh, for quite a while now. Interestingly, uh, time from latest uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection did not have statistical significance since you see the confidence interval sp spans across zero, uh, but there did appear to be a trend uh, also for uh, how recent your last COVID infection was in terms of how much protection you got there. So what this means is vaccine, again, is not only going to provide uh, additional benefit uh, or getting these new bivalent boosters is not only going to provide additional benefit for folks who are at high risk and prevent them from uh, getting hospitalized or, or, or dying, <clears throat> uh, but it is also most likely going to reduce transmission events in the community. And, and that becomes particularly important uh, in younger populations who, again, are responsible for most of the transmission events that occur in the community. And so uh, providing those boosters and getting high uptake of those boosters among uh, younger folks uh, and uh, certainly young adults and, and kids where transmission events most likely occur can have a significant impact in reducing transmission this fall. Unfortunately, we're not seeing a huge uh, surge in vaccine demand uh, associated with these new boosters. You can see that uh, the blip that we've seen of increased vaccinations, <clears throat> while that's good, it's uh, even smaller than the blip we saw 
back in the end of March, beginning of April, when the fourth doses of vaccine for uh, people over the age of 50 uh, were authorized. Uh, and so I, I'm not sure that we're going to see numbers nearly that high. And as you can see, we had relatively poor uptake of those fourth dose boosters in uh, 50 to 60 year olds, um, <clears throat> only 26% or so. And, and now we're spreading that across, uh, again, uh, folks, uh, 12 years and, and up, so a much larger population. So uh, we're going to we're having lower numbers of vaccination spread over a much larger population, and so that means a much lower percentage of people are going to get these recent doses. And similar to trends that we've discussed, that means that uh, the vast majority of people will not have had uh, a third or fourth or fifth dose, and uh, most Americans will not have had a dose of vaccine within six months or a year. Uh, now, the last study I'll talk about here uh, looks at uh, estimated disease uh, incidents among folks in New York State uh, during the BA1 Omicron wave. And this gives us uh, some insight into how much COVID has been going around over the last um, oh, nine months or so. Uh, so again, this was a study recently published in CID as uh, an accepted uh, reviewed publication, but released in preprint. Um, and again, looking at uh, disease uh, prevalence technically between uh, the 1st of January to the 16th of March. This was during the BA1 wave that caught about 68% of the, or 60 something percent of the uh, of the disease activity in BA1. So this was based on surveys uh, and you know a couple of caveats there. Their response rate for these surveys was, was pretty low. So you can see less than 1% of the mobile phone survey uh, um, contacts actually responded and less than 2% of the landline. Uh, <clears throat> there was a, a smaller proportion that had this uh, online panel uh, that had a relatively decent uh, response rate of 32%, but that was uh, targeted specifically at some populations that were underrepresented in the phone surveys. So uh, you always have to worry a little bit about bias in these responses. Are people who had COVID more likely to respond uh, than people who didn't, and, and et cetera? But what they found in this study is uh, during that period between the beginning of January and 15th of March, uh, about 27% of New York City residents that were surveyed uh, either had a diagnosis, a laboratory diagnosis of uh, SARS-CoV-2 or illness consistent with SARS-CoV-2 uh, and a history of a close contact. So those were considered probable cases. So about 27% uh, during that portion of the BA1 wave. Now you can see here, this is BA1, that large spike uh, in December, January of uh, 2020. 1, 2022. Uh, and the start date here of January 1st was uh, a, a good ways into the exponential rise phase. Uh, and so about, uh, again, 61% of the BA1 wave was from January 1st onward to March 15th. So that means about 39% they didn't catch. So you have to take that into account. Now, what we can do is go back and look at other data that allow, oops, sorry, allow us to kind of correlate um, what their findings were with what other data indicate. So this is the nationwide seroprevalence survey that's done uh, with commercial laboratories that we've uh, discussed a couple of times in the past. So if you look at these data, you can see that according to this, gosh darn, sorry, according to this estimate, um, uh, about 62, I think, percent of New Yorkers, at least by the middle of February, had antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 virus. And again, the specific antibody detects viral infection and not the vaccine because it's not spike, it's the N. Uh, and it was about 31% in December. Uh, and, and so uh, adjusting for a week or two for zero conversion, um, <clears throat> that roughly means about 23% of New Yorkers uh, had BA1 infection between uh, that period of time that the study occurred, uh, January 1st to March 15th. And then if you look at the entire BA1 wave, so going back to the beginning of December, it probably means around 33% of New York State residents were infected. But that 23%, uh, at least showing serological evidence of infection during that study period time, lines up relatively closely with the 27% they found on that study. Uh, if you look at official laboratory case reporting, now you have to do some adjustments and, and it's a, a little wonky because again, the BA1 wave lasted from the beginning of December to about March 15th. The study period uh, went from about um, 
February or January 1st uh, to March 15th. And sorry, I, I, I meant to put in that last one, that was a serology period, which went again from uh, about uh, the beginning of the BA1 wave uh, until uh, roughly February 4th or 5th, which is about two weeks before the, the last serology data was in. Uh, and so again, all of these things uh, relatively line up uh, in terms of um, how many cases there were. Now, if you look at total official counted cases uh, for the entire BA1 wave, uh, there were about 2.2 million recorded cases uh, of diagnosed, uh, laboratory diagnosed uh, SARS-CoV-2 in New York. So that's about 11% of New York residents. So if you look at that in comparison to what serology would show you, which is that about 33% of New York state residents got COVID during that period of time, that gives you an under ascertainment factor of three. That means about out of every three true cases of COVID during the BA1 wave in New York, uh, we were detecting one of those cases. Uh, so you need to multiply the official count by three to get the true count. Now, if we look at BA2 and 4.5, which is uh, you know the variants that we saw after March 15th predominantly, uh, we can see that there were about 1.1 million cases uh, that occurred during that period of time. Now, a rough swag is that we, we had uh, about uh, half uh, the amount of case ascertainment that we did during the BA1 wave. We've talked about this before a little bit too, but um, obviously our testing rates have gone down since uh, January of this year. And also more people have been using the home uh, antigen tests, which don't necessarily, most of which don't get recorded. And so uh, ascertainment is thought to have dropped off quite a bit. And I think a rough estimate is probably we're doing half as well as we were back in the beginning of the year. So if we use an under ascertainment factor of six, <clears throat> that means that there are really about six and a half million cases uh, of COVID that have occurred since March 15th. So uh, due primarily to BA2 and then BA4 and 5. And so that means about 34% of the New York population uh, had been a, has been infected since the, the middle of March when BA2 and 4 and 5 took over. So if you look at that uh, in the entire context of what's happened over the past year, uh, about this time last year, a, a little over 30% of New Yorkers uh, had zero uh, positivity or antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 indicated prior infection. We've talked about the fact that's probably a, a significant underestimate for a variety of reasons, including that the, those antibodies go away over time. But then if you look at BA1 and BA2, uh, about a third again in each of those waves got infected, uh, a third in BA1, and then probably a third of New Yorkers got infected with BA2 and BA4 or 5. So that means in the past six months, only about a third of the population in New York uh, had an infection uh, with uh, COVID. Uh, and probably close to two thirds uh, have not had BA4 uh, or BA5. So because of that significant uh, immune escape, as we've discussed with BA4 or 5, that means they probably have, uh, you know, relatively low degrees of protection from prior infection, at least uh, immunity against BA4 and 5. And, and it, it appears that probably a third or greater uh, of the New York state population hasn't had a COVID infection in the last year, so would potentially be highly susceptible. And, and then you're only looking at how many have had a dose of vaccine. And as we've discussed, only about uh, 13, 14% of the US population has had a dose of vaccine in the last six months. And uh, doesn't seem so far that the uh, bivalent vaccine boosters are gonna make a huge dent in those numbers. <clears throat> and so uh, we are uh, still, uh, very vulnerable in terms of uh, overall population immunity against BA5. And even if we don't have a new variant that's a, that arises over the next several months uh, to, to be associated with a winter wave, I, I think there's plenty of uh, green space that BA5 has to, to occupy to cause uh, more infections. And you know, good to note that these data are from New York State, which has a, a much higher rate of vaccination uh, and boosting overall than the rest of the U.S. So if you look at the U.S. average uh, for uh, a dose of vaccine and a, or, or a full course of vaccine with at least one booster is 33 percent. Uh, for New York State, that's 47 percent. So again, doing uh, quite a bit better than most other states in the U.S. So I, I think 
uh, immunologically, they're even better positioned uh, than the rest of the U.S. And as you can see, BA45 did uh, a pretty good number there. So um, I, I think all of that just points to the fact that uh, it's obvious that the, the pandemic is far from over. I certainly COVID-19 is far is not going away anytime soon. Uh, and again, I think is going to have um, uh, much more widespread uh, impact uh, this coming late fall and winter than, uh, than we've seen really in the past year.